So what I'd like to do is um, just kind of back up a little bit as we're trying to uh, just reframe a few things for you and make sure all these things are, uh, we're really giving you a lot more pathways to explore as far as you look at these uh, topics. And what I wanted to do is actually just take a moment and uh, go back with you to uh, the construct that Dr. Conor has just given you and give it to you from a little bit different perspective. Many of you are familiar with the New START acronym. And uh, although it is trademarked uh, by Weimar, we've uh, been very gracious over the years and uh, have been happy that the Adventist message is getting out there. Uh, one day we may want to work more closely with you, and uh, we're happy to try to support you right now in any way we can. But New Start, if you're uh, not familiar with the acronym, I know most of you are, but I just thought I would put it up here for you. It really summarizes a lot of what Dr. Conor gave, and I don't know how it is for you, but when I'm working with patients, it's very hard for them to remember a list of 10 things. But the New Start acronym gives them a way to uh, focus on these very ten power, uh, eight very powerful lifestyle principles, which uh, include most of the aspects of the ten that Dr. Conor has just mentioned. Well, where does New Start come from? It really isn't original with Weimar. It actually comes from the original creation account. You can find all of these eight essential elements in the original creation. They'll all be there in the recreated earth, the earth made new. Genesis 1.29, of course, is the first reference to diet in the Bible. Well, this was uh, later popularized for Seventh-day Adventists and for the world in the book Ministry of Healing. And on page 127, Ellen White gave this list of what she called true remedies. I should remind you, some people look at this list, they say, I don't see certain things on this list, so they must not be true remedies. Even Ellen White mentioned other things as true remedies. Give you an example, one that she spoke about was clean, sweet premises. She spoke about environmental health. It's not in this list. So yes, these are true remedies, but she's not giving here an exclusive list, so be careful that you uh, don't take, uh, take this too far. But these eight elements are the foundation for a healthy lifestyle, and uh, it's found there in Ministry of Healing, page 127. The question is, why does this work? Why does this program? You've heard a number of the mechanisms from Dr. Conor. I want to just give you a few other things, uh, ways that you might want to look at this. It actually complements what we've already heard. So nutrition is that first element in the New START acronym. And uh, one of the things I want you to think about today is hemorrheology. How many of you have heard about hemorrheology in this conference so far? We haven't really talked about it in any of the meetings that I've uh, been in. Hemorrheology, and I'll explain it to you uh, in a moment, is something that really integrates our lifestyle message very powerfully. Uh, what we learn is that a plant-rich diet optimizes this uh, uh, concept of rheology or hemorrheology. And I'm not going to belabor the uh, connection just yet, but let me give you a definition. Hemorrheology refers to the science that has to do with blood fluidity. Rheology has to do with the flow of complex fluids. Blood is not just a simple fluid. It has cellular components to it. It's a complex fluid. And so we speak about hemorrheology or blood fluidity. The question is, why is it important? You'll see why it's important for cancer in a minute. I'll review just very briefly some of the literature on it. And you'll see why this supports everything we've been talking about. Some of you know this statement very well in Second Testimonies, page 531. Ellen White said, perfect health depends on perfect circulation. The question is, is this just poetry or is this science? I'd like to suggest to you the spirit of prophecy is cutting-edge science, and it's cutting-edge science on the topic of hemorrheology. Hemorrheology is the science of perfect circulation. If I were to take the time, and uh, less than a year ago, I just did a, a six hours of continuing medical education for physicians. I gave a seminar on hemorrheology, and we went through all the diseases it's connected with and how lifestyle is connected with these things. We can't do that uh, in 30 minutes uh, or 20 minutes or whatever I have left. But I did want to show you how uh, hemorrheology relates to cancer. 
Now, if some of you go to Google and you put in hemorrheology or you go to PubMed, you're actually not going to find all the references that deal with hemorrheology because many of the studies that look at blood fluidity actually don't mention the term hemorrheology. So you have to look more broadly at factors, and we're going to do that right now with cancer just very briefly. We're looking at cancer and hemorrheology. Here's what's interesting. Here's, here's the first study that, uh, since we've been talking about surgery, I thought this would be an interesting one. This is a, uh, a study of women who are going to undergo surgery for gynecologic cancers, published, believe it or not, in the journal Clinical Hemorrheology and Microcirculation. Yes, there's whole journals devoted to this topic. In this particular study, they found that if they measured plasma viscosity, plasma viscosity is one measure of hemorrheology. They found if they measured this, it was a risk factor for subsequent thrombosis. You say, well, that's, where you, well, that's so obvious. If your blood fluidity isn't good, you're going to have more clots uh, after the surgery and, and, and subsequently. But they also found it was a marker for survival. Blood fluidity actually was correlated with survival. You say, well, why would this be? Yes, it was a significant predictor of longevity in these women who underwent ovarian cancer surgery. Well, it's interesting what the uh, researchers speculated as far as the mechanism for this connection. They put it this way, in gynecologic cancer patients, the combination of an increase in red blood cell aggregation, that's the tendency of red blood cells to stick together, and plasma viscosity. These are two factors that affect hemorrheology. So they're saying bad hemorrheology impairs blood flow properties and may induce hypoxia. It may cause low oxygen levels in the tissue, and this is going to favor microclots, thrombosis, that then would set the stage for metastasis. You say, well, this sounds very speculative. Well, it sounds very speculative if you don't understand this, the science, because there's a lot now that's been published about how our blood fluidity and things like our platelet stickiness is a risk factor, actually, for cancer and for cancer metastasis. It's a fascinating line of study, and it, it dovetails with what Dr. Conor was talking about. Although we didn't mention hemorrheology, he was giving you a program for optimal blood fluidity that can be used both as a cancer preventive and as a cancer treatment strategy. So if some of you want this presentation, I'm happy to make it available. And uh, I probably should have put my email address up there for you. Um, maybe I'll do that before we finish. But uh, anyway, whether you have a flash drive with you today uh, or not, I'm, I'm making that available for you because we're going through this quite quickly. I realize that. Here's the point I want to make. What researchers are showing us, and they've been showing us for years, going back into the 80s and then more recent data, they're saying that there's evidence that tumor cells interact with the clotting cells in the body, if you will, and it can increase the risk of problems with metastasis and uh, poor outcomes for cancer. This is a review published a few years ago on this subject. Listen to the title. The title is Platelets Linking Hemostasis and Cancer. The reason I'm showing you this, if, if you're getting a little confused with the speed or the tempo of my material, all these things, what Dr. Conor has just shared with you, whether it's exercise, whether it's weight reduction, whether it's eating more plant uh, foods, these improve blood fluidity. We just don't have time to flesh all this out in this presentation. But what I'm trying to help you see, there are multiple mechanisms why this lifestyle is powerful, not only for prevention, but for treatment. Actually, this is a diagram from that uh, review article. What it's showing you is actually what happens to tumor cells in the bloodstream. Platelets can actually surround and sequester that tumor cell, and instead of helping your body eliminate the tumor cell, they actually protect the tumor cell from the immune system, and this actually can increase the risk of metastatic disease. So there's a whole research literature that's actually supporting the Adventist lifestyle, 
And uh, there you see the name of Judah Folkman, who Dr. Conroy was talking about. But he's one of the people that we, we speak about. We look at this research talking about the variety of things that we've been hearing about in this workshop. And it brings us right back to this optimal lifestyle. So again, I, I refer you to that, uh, that reference a few years ago. Uh, it goes through some of these things in great interest. Raise, look, for example, uh, platelet count, higher platelet counts related to greater risk of metastatic cancer, as are some other blood fluidity uh, related factors. Well, let me hasten beyond this to the subject of phytochemistry and why one illustration of why this is so important. Presumably, many of the circulatory benefits of plant foods are because of those phytochemicals that Dr. Connor was telling you about. And when he asked me the question, even though I didn't give a very loud answer, about why shouldn't we just focus on good meat and good dairy products and uh, range-fed uh, chickens and their eggs, the reason is there's something better. All of those things are phytochemically deficient. They don't have phytochemicals. The powerful cancer-preventing foods are the whole plant foods. This is what we want to emphasize. So when we have a patient at Weimar who's concerned about cancer recurrence, when we have a patient who's dealing with cancer, they're on a whole plant food diet. And uh, that's one of the foundations for the program. There's a body of research literature that shows us specific foods that can help plant fluidity. These are some uh, either whole foods or plant agents, garlic, uh, grapes, quercetin, which is in many plant foods. All of these things help to make the blood more fluid. They help make the platelets less likely to sequester or to protect the cancer uh, from your immune system. If we were to do a whole seminar on phytochemicals, we could do a whole week on it. Uh, I wouldn't be the optimal person to do it, but we have Dr. Craig here and others uh, in our midst who are, are really uh, nutritional experts who could cover this in detail. But let me just give you a few examples. Dr. Connor gave you some. He mentioned uh, lycopene that you see on that list. But we could go through phytochemical after phytochemical. For example, the anthocyanins. These are found in things like red apples, grapes, berries, cherries, tomatoes, garlic, and onions. Now, some of you know that uh, three of my grandparents were born in Italy, because I told you that. And uh, one of my grandparents, uh, born in Sicily, I'm thinking of him, he died in his 90s. How many of you think he knew about anthocyanins? He knew nothing about anthocyanins, I'm convinced. I never even had the chance to ask him about it because he died before I knew anything about anthocyanins. But I don't think he knew anything about it. So therefore, he got no benefit from anthocyanins. Is that true or false? No, he was getting cutting edge nutrition because he was eating lots of things like tomatoes and onions and garlic and grapes. These were staples in his diet. Here's the point I'm trying to make for you. If you want to be on the cutting edge of nutritional science, don't wait for the next hot phytochemical to be discovered and rush out to the drugstore and buy it. You understand what I'm saying? Don't tell your patients that that's the optimal program. Just like Dr. Conor shared with you, the most powerful program is to eat the whole plant foods. And it isn't an, is an amazing how good God is. I actually have taken some supplements from time to time. I do pre prescribe them in uh, certain uh, situations. But I've noticed that none of them taste as good as an apple or grapes or uh, onions. Have you noticed that? So God's given us these good tasting foods that are loaded with these health enhancing compounds. Anthocyanins, not only, you're, we're talking about cancer. Here's the wonderful thing. You take these to decrease your risk of cancer. That's the bottom one. And you're actually taking something that's also going to help you with osteoarthritis because they help to activate cartilage repair. They're anti-inflammatory. They'll, he they'll help your blood vessels relax. And they have antioxidant properties more powerful than many of the supplements that people are taking. They're taking vitamin E and vitamin C and beta carotene. By the way, I know we didn't have time to speak much about it, let me share this study with you just very briefly because we've alluded to it a number of times in this seminar. Are you aware that if you look at smokers epidemiologically, if you look at smokers and you measure the beta carotene levels in their blood, you'll find that those with higher beta carotene levels have less lung cancer. 
Have you heard about this? This has been known for years. So they did a study, and what they did is they did a randomized controlled trial, and they gave smokers beta carotene supplements to see if it would decrease the risk of lung cancer. What do you think happened? Yeah, some of you know the research. It increased their risk of cancer. You say, well, how could that be? How could when you look at the free living people, if their beta carotene levels are high, they have low rates of lung cancer. But then you give them beta carotene, raise their beta carotene level, and their lung cancer risk goes up. What's going on? The best explanation is beta carotene is just one of a whole family of retinoids. A whole family of compounds, like lycopene, is in that family. And if you overwhelm your system with beta carotene, it interferes with the metabolism of all these other good phytochemicals that God's given us. So be very careful. The, the, the national and international recommendations are very clear. You shouldn't be taking vitamin supplements to try to prevent cancer. And when it comes to cancer treatment, you should be very careful before taking supplements. Well, let's continue. And again, I'll just give you a few other examples. Turmeric. I do use turmeric fairly liberally in my practice. We typically use it in our cancer patients. We use it in patients who have inflammatory disorders. It is a natural compound, very exciting uh, a compound, curcumin, which is in turmeric, that yellow herb. You're all familiar with this yellow herb. It's used in curry and other things. Turmeric is not only cancer preventive, but it's been shown to be anti-inflammatory. It has effects on suppressing platelet activity. And what's very exciting is it actually has heavy metal chelating properties. A growing concern is that we're increasing our risk for neurodegenerative diseases because of our exposure to heavy metals. There's some natural compounds like curcumin that seem to be able to bind heavy metals and decrease heavy metal burden in the body. So turmeric is something I really endorse. By the way, if you ate lunch here today, I think there was turmeric in the uh, chickpea or garbanzo uh, dish. So some of you, if you're already feeling your mind is clearer, probably not from that, but at least you can make the connection a little more vividly. Ferulic acid. Again, you see anti-cancer, but I want you to notice as we go through this list, none of these things are just cancer protective. They have a broad range of protective effects. Let me tell you why I'm sharing this with you. Because this, doing research like this, some of you uh, uh, might know a little bit about my background, but I've done a variety of things over the years. Although I've done probably more clinical medicine than anything. I've done writing, I've done medical editing. There was a period in my time where I was uh, running a uh, consulting business. One of the clients that I had wanted me to research phytochemicals for a book that they were writing. And uh, as I'm doing all this research, at this time I am a, a vegan, and I'm reading through all this, and I'm going through this research, and I'm reading what God has put in these whole plant foods. Now, I've got to be honest with you, even at that time, this was, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 years ago, uh, remember, I told you about my background, my European roots. Where were three of my grandparents born? Do any of you remember? Italy. They were born in Italy. Now, how many of you know something about pasta? Any of you know anything about pasta? What is it usually made with? Gluten. Yeah, it's made with gluten. It's made with white flour. And so uh, even though I was a vegan, I was still eating white pasta. And uh, I'm doing this research, and I'm saying, you know, there's only so much room in my stomach. By the way, you shouldn't try to fill your stomach when you eat. This is not optimal. But there's only so much you can eat in your stomach. In a, and, and I start to think, well, why would I want to eat anything less than the best foods? And what happened is I started to develop a distaste, just mentally, first of all, for that white pasta. Now, if it's all that's available, it's what I'll have, but at home, it's whole grain pasta. At first, did I like it as well as the white? What do you think? No, but I started eating it, and you know what happened? I developed an enjoyment for it. Let me tell you something very important, because we often don't talk about this. But are you aware that God has created you and every person you work with with the capacity to develop new enjoyments? Are you aware of this? You can develop new enjoyments. You can develop an enjoyment for the lower salt eating, 
you can get away from those salt-cured foods that Dr. Conor was telling you increases your risk of stomach cancer. You can develop a taste. Instead of having those highly refined desserts, you can have healthy desserts that are made from whole foods. Don't use things that have lots of refined sugars. And they say, Dr. DeRose, this is very bad news that you're giving us. No, I'm just trying to tell you what the Lord did in my own life. I wasn't raised a Seventh-day Adventist. I didn't know this stuff. But even after I knew it, I wasn't applying it all. And so as you look at evidence like this, what God was speaking to me about, did you catch it, was something better. It's not that it... It's not that you're evil if you had white pasta. I think I had some today. That's what they were serving, and I had some in one of the dishes. It's not, you know, you're going to go to your potluck and you're going to throw out anything that has no whole grain food and tell the church member never to come back again. No, this isn't the message. You want, but the message is God has loaded these foods with protective benefits, and if we emphasize these whole foods, we are going to get powerful anti-cancer benefits. So we could take lots of time and speak about this, but if, if you're interested, like I said, I can give you more information. It's not just phytochemicals, it's things like uh, uh, nitrates that we used to think were only bad. There's actually good properties from these uh, compounds and plants that help with blood fluidity. So the bottom line, through multiple mechanisms, these whole foods are helping us to turn back the clock on cancer. Dr. Conor mentioned uh, the beneficial uh, fats and the harmful fats. I want to remind you about something. And this is, I find, even many Seventh-day Adventists don't realize this. And this is simply this. Omega-3 fats. Most people think they're fish fats, right? How many of you are aware that fish do not make omega-3 fat? Omega-3 fat is only made from plants. So fish that are high in omega-3 fat content are only high in it because they've been eating plants or phytoplankton or things that in the sea or in the waters that are rich in omega-3 fats. So many of us today recommend not that we eat fish to get our omega-3 sources because fish throughout the world, even if you seem to get them from pristine sources, are t some of the most contaminated. In fact, some would say the most single category of contaminated foods in our diet. Uh, this is definitely true in America and in many places throughout the world. And I'll tell you, it's very deceptive. I, I can't take time to give you all the details on this, but um, some of you know I host a weekly radio show. One of the guests on my radio show, I'll try to give you this very briefly, he actually researched fish that were being caught in two different waters in the United States. There were polluted waters by this city and none of the fishermen would catch the fish there. They'd go to the apparently crystal clear waters and catch the fish. When he actually did the research, he found the fish that were being caught in the crystal clear waters actually had higher levels of many of the toxins than the fish in the apparently polluted waters. The whole point of his research was this. Just because you think you caught the fish from an area that had good water doesn't mean the fish lived there all its life. Okay, And so fish have the highest source of mercury in most diets, in the American diet for sure, I'm sure it's probably true here in Europe, is fish. So I'm not telling you there's nothing good in fish, I'm just saying, why don't we get it firsthand from omega-3 plant sources? That's what we recommend at Weimar rather than eating fish. And if you still love to eat the fish and you're eating, I will still eat at your table. If you give me a choice, I'll pass by the fish. But I would, I would still think of you as my brother or sister. Really, God works with us, really, in a continuum. We don't all change overnight. And so we want to be careful that as we learn these things, we don't leave with a motivation to judge other people, but to help them. And I will tell you, I'll go a step further. There have actually been people that I've recommended eat animal products. Uh, because of certain issues or where they live in a certain part of the world. I've given lectures in uh, countries that aren't very affluent and I've not said anything about a total vegetarian diet because the people were getting such marginal levels of calories that if they weren't to eat the eggs from the, little, the, the one chicken they had, they would probably risk malnutrition. Do you understand what I'm sharing with you? So this is the optimal diet that we're presenting, everything being equal, but uh, there are certain situations where that optimal diet may not be optimal. Well, let me move on to talk with you about one other topic. 
Um, this is just a, a slide here from um, the, uh, I believe this is from the Adventist uh, health study data. It's actually looking, just giving an example of how putting this together and looking at a single cancer. Dr. Connor showed you some uh, larger slides, but look at one cancer that is a particularly feared cancer and that of pancreatic cancer. You know with this cancer, all of you who are in the medical field, you realize that this is not a cancer where we typically measure survival in years. Survival is typically measured in weeks or months. With pancreatic cancer, it's usually caught at an advanced uh, stage. But look here. What's being compared in the light blue bars are people eating these foods three or more times a week compared to less than once a week. And you can see here when it comes to meat, poultry, and fish, a dramatic increase in risk of pancreatic cancer in those who are eating these foods more frequently. You look at eggs, the relationship is even is even more remarkable, you can see a very strong relationship between egg consumption and increased risk of pancreatic cancer. You see exactly the opposite with the last category, and that's the beans, lentils, and peas. And so uh, this is, uh, is there. Some of you are wondering, this thought just came to my mind, why I'm showing you some slides that look very nice and others look very simple. Uh, these slides are actually part of a series that uh, I did with Doug Batchelor from Amazing Facts, where we combined some of the biblical and health principles uh, called Amazing Health. It's available on DVD if any of you are interested in that from Amazing Facts. Some of you also asked me about the uh, hypertension series I mentioned in one of the other seminars. Amazing Facts at, uh, actually has that uh, three-hour reversing hypertension series I did too. So if you're looking for other resources that are pre-packaged that you want to use, and if some of you have a motivation, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you have a motivation to translate those things, um, I'd be very interested to uh, explore those with you. Let me talk with you about exercise in the remaining few minutes that we have. Exercise has many cancer preventive benefits, not only with blood fluidity as far as hemorrheology, but it also, as you heard Dr. Connor speaking, helps you to lower your body fat, which is related to lowering cancer risk, has these favorable effects on insulin dynamics, which has been related. But I wanted to give you some practical things about exercise, because I know many of you are very busy. You've been very busy during these uh, series of meetings, and many of you have not been exercising. And you thought you had a special dispensation because you were at a health meeting. Well, I want to tell you, you still should make time for exercise. And if you didn't bring the proper clothing and it's been raining, uh, next time pack a raincoat with you uh, so you can get outside. But some of you uh, feel you don't have enough time for exercise. Uh, in my review of the, the literature, as little as six minutes of exercise, there's studies out there that show as little as six minutes of exercise can measurably improve your immune system. So if you haven't gotten any exercise today yet, I bet you could sneak in six minutes sometime between now and when you go to bed. Don't you think you could do that? So, uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, exercise, of course, has mental health benefits. We didn't talk a lot about this, but stress is a, is a significant uh, deranger of our metabolism. Dr. Connor mentioned that a bit, but this is a real concern for us as far as the immune system as well. Uh, there's more benefits to exercise that uh, I'm not going to talk with you about, but I want to give you some motivating statements. This is from the book My Life Today, so it's a, a collection of Ellen White's material. It's a devotional book. If you don't have it, it's a very excellent book. Listen to what she wrote about on My Life Today, page 136. If you took nothing away from this conference but this single statement and you put it into practice, it would measurably improve your health, I, I promise you. She says it this way, morning exercise in walking in the free, invigorating air of heaven or cultivating flowers, small fruits and vegetables, is necessary to a healthful circulation of the blood. It is the surest safeguard against colds, coughs, congestions of the brain and lungs, inflammation of the liver, the kidneys and the lungs, and a hundred other diseases. And I would suggest to you if we took the time, this, you would see this was not poetry, but this is fact powerful health-giving uh, principle. If you would make a practice of getting exercise every morning, and especially where? Outdoors. Outdoor exercise. Now, I'm very disturbed about something that has happened in this workshop, and that is there were some medical students who left. I can't imagine they would have left before I showed the next slide. So if any of you have friends who are medical students who left, make sure they get this uh, reference. 
Uh, this is not the one. We're leading up to it. There's one more. This tells you to do what? Go out and exercise how often? Every day, even though some things indoors have to be neglected. I have to confess to you, as a young adult, uh, I came into the Seventh-day Adventist church, and uh, God got my interest in the health message. But uh, as a young Seventh-day Adventist, I thought I shouldn't do any physical activity on the Sabbath. And I shouldn't go and do any exercise. And uh, I found after a while, it was a year or two probably, that I realized I felt the worst on the Sabbath. And I realized it because I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting in meetings and things and reading. You need to get out on the Sabbath too. So hopefully tomorrow, even though there'll be a lot of good programs, that we'll find some time to get outside. Some of you will get a, a jump start and you'll be out early in the morning. And the Lord willing, I might even see you out there. But now here's the one for the medical students. Uh, make sure they get this uh, reference. From Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 1, page 117. For a healthy young man, stern, severe exercise is strengthening to brain, bone, and muscle. I mean, this is good physiology. And it is an essential preparation for the difficult work of a physician. Without such exercise, the mind cannot be in working order. It cannot put forth the sharp, quick action that will give scope to its powers. It becomes inactive. What do you think? Do you think we should uh, prioritize exercise? There is one problem with this statement. I'm just going to be honest with you. I still think of myself as a healthy young man. So one day if you hear I die from overexercise, you'll know that I didn't uh, properly apply the statement. Okay, well, our time really has, uh, has slipped away from us, and we do need to close. But I want to remind you of one last thing when it comes to exercise. There is special benefit, as Dr. Connor was mentioning, uh, getting sunshine. Uh, by the way, in this part of the world, you can't make vitamin D for probably, uh, oh, I didn't look at the latitude before I arrived, but I'm guessing it's about four months of the year, even if you get sun exposure. The sun doesn't come up high enough above the horizon for the, for the ultraviolet B rays to um, to reach the skin and uh, allow you to make vitamin D. So vitamin D supplementation we do recommend, especially in the winter months, if you're not able to get uh, adequate sunshine uh, during the uh, uh, more favorable weather for vitamin D production. But I just remind you that historically Seventh-day Adventists recommended useful exercise. And uh, this has additional benefits on mental health. Uh, it has additional benefits as far as getting you out in the fresh air and sunshine. If all you can do is get on the treadmill, I mean, that's better than nothing. But if you can get outside, do it, like uh, Ellen White said, even if other things have to be neglected. Mm -hmm.